I think it's going to be worse than the financial crisis. I'm saying it's very much 1929-ish. I've been saying that for a while. The macro is what I pointed out. This is the biggest one, I think, in our lifetime. The number one risk factor, I think, right now is I fully expect the S&P 500 to do what normally happens in U.S. recession, which hasn't even started yet, drop 50% during the last two recessions, peak to trial. That means it gets closer to 3000 than the current price around 4000 We're speaking now with Mike McGlone, macro strategist from Bloomberg Intelligence, and he has some interesting and very important research to share with us. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be part of the new David Lynn report because I've always enjoyed talking to you and I'm, I'm excited for you and endeavors and I hope to do my best to help you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for lending us uh, your voice. You have excellent analysis and uh, I've always been a big fan of your research. You've published a few reports in the last week, and I'm just going to share a quote from one of your reports. You wrote that deflation may be enduring. Uh, the combination of unprecedented liquidity due to the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine spurred a commodity peak in 2022 that appears poised to endure reviving entrenched deflationary forces. It seems to me, reading this report, that uh, people may be concerned about the wrong thing everyone's concerned about. Well, not everyone, but a lot of people are concerned about inflation going back on the rise, even though we've had declining CPI. And for the longest time, I've been hearing about stagflationary risks, but you're arguing for a deflation. I want to hear what you uh, have to say here. Oh, significant. Um, I, I, it's good thing about markets. We have both sides of markets, but let's look at what produced the inflation and is it enduring? The answer is no. What in produced the inflation we have right now is the biggest pump in liquidity in the history of mankind that's dumping the most rapid pace I've ever seen. You look at things like money supply, bank deposits. We're actually having a bank run at the moment. Bank deposits are running negative 2 to 3%, just like money supply on a year-over-year basis. So that's liquidity dumping. And that's a classic measure of economic cycles. You have all big booms in history come in the back of um, excessive liquidity and all busts come as they contract. We're in the middle of that contracting stage right now. What just happened yesterday was OPEC cutting is almost the best sign ever of a good bear market when OPEC cuts their supply because they're panicking and they have to because they see the potential for demand contracting. What does it do? And in the meantime, as our economist Anna Wong at Bloomberg Intelligence pointed out, well, we were clearly calling for a recession in Q3. That might pull forward a little bit. We're clearly calling for inflation and the Fed to continue tighten. That might heighten the Fed's <laughs> accelerate inflation. It helps and it alleviates the ability for plunging commodities to help reset the market. So um, that's one little factor. But the macro is what I pointed out. This is the biggest one, I think, in our lifetimes. And it's just getting started. And I'll end with this. The key thing I like to point out is we are in a stage right now, typically the Bloomberg Commodity Index on a 12-month basis. This is down 20%. Yeah, it's bounced a little bit yesterday and recently. But we've never had a period like that with the Fed when they were tightening. And the Fed and central banks are still tightening. That is part of that pendulum and is probably going to swing down hard in Q2 and the rest of the year. Uh, I'm going to come back to oil because that is significant. And we had big moves today on Monday. But uh, you keep saying that this is going to be the biggest in our lifetime. What exactly are you alluding to, Mike? Um, I think it's going to be worse than the financial crisis. I'm saying it's very much 1929-ish. I've been saying that for a while. And it's just, I've been studying the history. I just read the book, Boom and Bust, recently. I think one of the authors, name was Quinn. There's a dual author there. And it's just, everything's lined up to um, the foundation for this to get much worse. Now, the thing is, you got to be careful um, being a weenie for the teeny, training for the little short-term moves. Now, we've had a bounce in the stock market. We've had a bounce in cryptos. We've had a bounce in copper. And they all bounced on this potential thing. Oh, maybe it's over. It's a soft landing. It'll be fine. The Fed's going to start easing. And I think it's very unlikely for the Fed to ease until risk assets drop to a new lower plateau. So the number one risk factor I think right now is I fully expect the S&P 500 to do what normally happens in U.S. recession, which hasn't even started yet, drop 50% during the last two recessions, peak to trial. That means it gets closer to 3,000 than the current price around 4,000. And I'll rope in um, copper on that. I overlay the S&P 500 with copper. You just divide the five, S&P 500 by 1,000. It's the exact same price as the dollar per pound price of copper, around four. And I fully expect that to head towards three. And a key thing that's pointing that way are the U.S. bond market. You look at just a two-year note, it's at 4%. Fed funds are on 5%. That's an inverted curve. You look at the bond, the long bond, the 10-year notes. At the time we're speaking, it's three, 
I'm sorry, 3.43. The low for the year is around three, just below that. It's almost at a new low yield for the year. That's the bond market saying we're heading towards recession. The stock market hasn't figured it out yet. I, I want to ask you <laughs> lots to unpack there, but I want to touch on the recessionary, uh, recession aspect first. I actually did some analysis on my own um, uh, yesterday, actually. I looked into uh, how the S&P has behaved in prior recessions, and the Ember designated 12 recessions since 1948. Um, of those 12, I've noticed that five of them during the course of recession saw the S&P actually rise during the recession. So I'm, I, I want to ask an expert, actually. Mike, do you think that it's not a perfectly accurate statement to make that we can definitely expect a bear market during a recession because prior cycles have indicated that sometimes we may get a gain. There's a wonderful thing about statistics and using history. Oftentimes human beings use it for comfort when they shouldn't be. Like the key <laughs> quote. Well, no, I mean, that's a good one. The key quote during the, the massive run up in the real estate yeah. prices to the peak in 2006 was, oh, we never had an annual year of decline in real estate value, Mike. Well, we're going to have one because they went up so fast, they're going to go down just as fast. Now, that happened. And even Greenspan, Chairman Greenspan at the time, testified against it. So the key thing is what's missing from that analysis. I look at one simple example, as I just had it, was playing with it a little bit, as you look at the 50-week moving average S&P 500 below the 100-week moving average. It's just about 5%. There's never been one case going back to 1965 where the market was already tilting down that, that much and the Fed was tightening. There's your difference. Typically, what happens, the Fed started, the last time we had a tilt like this anywhere near it, the Fed started easing aggressively. And that's what's changed in history. That's what's changed with COVID. The Fed and all markets learn the lessons of too much liquidity and inflation. That will never happen again. Well, they will provide the liquidity at an excessive pace like they have an ease with ease with the ease they have in the past. So this is where we're tilting now. Guiding back lower, Fed still tightening as markets. Yes, we've had this bounce. So that's the difference. We will not get that easing until the whites of the eyes of a clear recession. And that's not my words. That's from Chairman Powell. So he's also said that they're not going to be easing anytime soon. But yeah, unemployment is just is at an all-time low. And it's almost a, historically, unemployment, when it bottoms from a very low plateau or trough, it almost always has a recession. That's starting to happen. It's a stated goal of the Fed. So also, you have to look at things that really scare me the most, David, in the macro is right before this happened. As we are into this liquidity pump the last few years, the U.S. stock market reached, the stock market reached the highest ever versus GDP. It looked quite parabolic. The highest ever versus global equities, XUS. The highest ever versus housing versus sales. And it's just starting to roll over. And also, guess what's happening with the boomers? You can give them a two-year note, and in two years, they'll get back about, at the moment, 8%, which is half of 4%, or double 4%. Uh, you mentioned uh, Chairman Powell. He did make a remark in the last uh, meeting, and he said that he is not going to ease until uh, the labor market softens. I think where his words are, you're absolutely right. He's not easing anytime soon. What an employment print do you think he needs to see before that happens? No clue. It's going to be the trajectory. Let's look at the last time they when they started easing in September 2007. CPI, PPI were still on an upward trajectory. In fact, PPI increased that and peaked that year around 10 percent, and they were easing. Now they're actually still, the PPI is turning down hard and they're still tightening. So where it happens, where it goes, I don't know. But the point is once that unemployment starts ticking up, it's almost guaranteed the recession will be starting at some point soon. And then that's that le the rules of long and variable lags. Just the fact that we're still talking about it a year after the most aggressive central bank hike and coordinated central bank hikes ever is the macro. And it's the long and variable lags that are just getting started. The banking crisis is a tree in that forest. We've we talked about where you just mentioned that this could be as we're looking at 1929 in terms of scale. This could be the worst downturn in our lifetime. Let's compare the economics of our current situation to 1929, uh, decade long Great Depression. We didn't see the stock markets recover until I believe the 1950s to to uh, to the pre 1929 highs. And it was just an awful time. Uh, any indicators that could point to any similarities now for you to make that comparison? Tightening into a recession was the major focus the number one thing way things always happen in markets is you almost you never get significant corrections without lofty prices he always has to be in the back of what's happened before so this is a, here give you an example a unique thing i really enjoyed around COVID when people say no this 20s is going to be like the 1920s all over again the people forgot that the 1920s came in the back that big stock market rally and the big t came in the back of a significant depression right before that jim grant wrote a whole book about it right around world war one and around up to 2000 to, to um, right to the 2018-19. Uh, that was the foundation for the bull market. What was the foundation for a bear market? Prices went up too high. 
exact same th- thing happened. Prices have gone up way too far, uh, you know, just on most measures. And now we have this tightening as we tilt and lower. So it's, it's, unstoppable the way I see it right now. And the key things I look at is just what's hacking, happening with, there's a bank run, clearly a bank run. And just the rules of bank runs, you're never supposed to be hawkish in bank runs. But the bank run is clearly happening. We see more deposits leaving U.S. banks on a daily basis. The The pace on a 12-month basis is minus 2%. That's never happened. Our database is going back to 1960. It's always been positive. Um, and they're still tightening. So there's a bank run. It's just different. People don't, you don't run to the bank anymore. You pick up your phone, you push a button, boom, and you're you're buying treasury bonds. Uh, or you're buying a Schwab um, TLT or something, an ETF that tracks it. So that's the difference from the past. And to me, that's the key thing. Bottom line is tilting toward Massive pump in liquidity, that's dumping. Bottom line, that's what happened in the Great Depression. And one way you try that really shows that is you show money supply. It looked just like the stock market did in 1929. If you do it like on a 120-month basis, just that measure. And also a key thing, if it looks just like that, if you measure the U.S. stock market versus the MSCI X U.S. stock market, same thing. Big pump that's starting to roll over. It's That's scary. Uh, okay, so I, I saw this chart showing a, a massive inflow – into money market funds, is that correlated with the bank runs that you're talking about? Exactly, that's money coming right out of the bank. So you cannot not expect a credit contraction when money is leaving the banks at this pace. There's no way to avoid it. They can't lend it out. They can't rehypothecate, hypothecate, whatever. They can't do fractional reserve lending when they don't have the reserves. And when the reserve assets, their duration matches are dropping, dropping. You know, they they did not really apparently are in our stress test. We did not measure the. Uh, the duration risk of the Fed raising high rates at the highest pace, the greatest pace in history. So that to me is inevitable. The key thing is what solves that problem? What's what got us there? Fed raising rate hikes really fast. Cutting rates is what helps solve it. And they're still hiking rates. Mike, let me present to you a bull case for the stock markets. And please feel free to disagree and challenge this if you if you if you want to. Uh, the Nasdaq saw its best quarter one since 2020. Uh, this momentum, some argue, is likely to continue. Some economists have said that the, the, the stock markets have presented leading indicators for how the economy is going to do. So perhaps the stock markets are seeing some positive signs of economic recovery and no recession is in sight. That's number one. And number two, uh, it seems to me that the uh, just based on market sentiment, that banking fears have largely subsided. So can you address both these points? There's virtually no way banking fairs have subsided if you don't fix the problem. The problem with banks was um, risk asset uh, manage, uh, duration mismatch because ras- um, interest rates ra- rose so fast. That's still rising, and there's still a bank run. So money's still leaving the bank, so there's a problem there. And in all bear markets, you have your, your most significant bounces. Good example is market dropped 50% in 1929. In 1930, it rallied 50%, and then the rest is history. That, I think, is happening in a mini case right now. We just had this decent bounce in the NASDAQ around 19 20%. Now, in the long term, I fully expect tech is going to outperform, but Silicon Valley Bank is very part of that. And I look at it as it, 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 the Fed's stated goal is to reduce inflation. And what really helped pump inflation was rising risk assets. So what you're hearing and readings have to be very careful, sell-side research, and people have a vested interest in that working. And I look at it as this is similar to the peak in 2000, and then the peak again in 2007 and 8. Um, and that one in 2000 took 14 years or so to really get above there. I think this is going to be similar. It's just normal. But the thing that's different is we have, an, we have a significant bank run and the Fed is still tightening. I want to talk about uh, your deflationary outlook one more time. It sounds to me like good news. I mean, just from, from a layman's perspective, yeah. um, helping to <laughs> educate the public here, We've had two years of high inflation. People are looking for a reprieve. Deflation might be that reprieve. And of course, when we talk about deflation, you think about like things like TVs and uh, computers and technology, technological innovations coming down in price over time. That's not what really what you're talking about, is it? Everything. So that's a good indication. So let's look at the world's benchmark measure for heat, electricity and fertilizer. U.S. natural gas, its price right now is two. It first started trading in 1990. The high last year was around 10. It's dropped 80%. Now, that's just the macro. You look at housing owners, equivalent rent, plunging on a globe, on a U.S. scale, and mostly global. Why? What really pumped that? Easy money. It's all turning around. Um, part of what pumped it also was 
stock asset values. I mean, if you, it's um, it, it's the classic case of everybody, the wealth effect is completely reversing, and it's the stated goal of the Federal Reserve to reduce this. So I think we're going to have deflation in everything, but that's what happens normally in recessions, which is this typical case. If you look at the yield curve, the probability of a recession is the highest since 1982, and you get um, deflation in, and of all assets, most particularly probably not bonds, treasury bonds and high high uh, value bonds and probably not gold, which I fully expect to continue to break out and potentially Bitcoin. But the whole thing is just simply right now we're in a process of reverting one of the biggest pumps in liquidity and asset prices ever, which means deflation. And it could indication, forward looking indications are those. We've seen what's happening in housing its peak. We've seen happening with mortgage applications, things like um, new homes under construction, turning over, home sales going down. Uh, I mentioned mortgage applications, but one of the key leading indicators is commodities, lumbers collapsed, Crude oil has collapsed. Crude oil is down 19% on a one-year basis, and gold is one of the only few commodities that's still up on a 12-month basis, a one-year basis. And I think that trend is continue. Deflating crude oil, which on the price on the screen is the same as first traded in 2007 or so. If you compare that to money supply and GDP, that's clearly deflation. But you look at the price of gold, the end of the quarter was the highest price ever. Those are trends. Deflating crude oil and fossil fuels, inflating um, partially fueling inflating gold, I think, are just getting started. And I don't really see a significant end to that until you have a elongated period and lag from significant Federal Reserve easing. That's usually how it works. I, I, I want to close off our macro talk before we get to uh, the assets um, asset side. I want to close off the macro talk on, on this note, Mike. Is it possible to have a long-term deflationary environment coupled with growth? I mean, we think about deflation and disinflation coupled with economic recessions, which is historically true, but is it possible to have long-run growth with disinflation or perhaps outright deflation? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's basically what we've had for 10, 20 years, particularly since the, the um the commodities and crude oil peaked in 2008, we've had significant disinflation and that disinflation fact of rapidly advancing technology is going to accelerate. And I think what happened with the war is it triggered the whole world to accelerate the process of technology replacing things like fossil fuels and renewables. That's just accelerating. That's just normal. That was a normal pace before. I mean, I bought, I have an electric car I bought almost 10 years ago. I have electric bikes. I put solar panels on my house almost 10 years ago. That process has just got a lot more. Now there's nothing like, uh, what's the, uh, the best thing for all invention, invention, necessity. So that necessity is kicking in. But right now, I think we have to go through that reset process. And the key bottom line in the macro is number one, number 10 on the world scale, the Fed uh, on a one to 10 scale is the Federal Reserve is still tightening. Liquidity is being pulled. If you're long liquid assets, you are fighting the Fed and the most central banks on the planet who are still following the Fed and tightening. So opening uh, sentence to your second paragraph, severe deflationary economic reset is gaining fuel. What is this economic reset going to look like when all this is over? Good question. I'm across that bridge when we get there. The way I Fair see enough. it... Um, well, I mean, it's 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 uh, it, the way I see it. It's got to start. I, the way I see the next scenario is, if the stock market doesn't have that significant correction, then I have to reset the whole view. Um, the bond market says it will. Um, the yield curve says it will, and the Federal Reserve is looking for that so they can reduce that lagging measure of inflation, which is an afford measure is tilting towards deflation, natural gas. So I don't really know yet. I. Don't want to waste too many words. And right now I'm looking on the first bridge right now. And that is, to me, the next key thing to watch is, if I'm right, the S&P 500 should head towards 3,000. And if it doesn't, the problem is, if it doesn't roll over, the Fed's going to keep tightening until it goes down, which is the stated goal at the moment. Okay. Well, how much is the, um, how much is the uh, stock market driven by energy right now? Big moves in the oil market on Monday as we speak. As you mentioned, uh, over the weekend, uh, OPEC made some moves to their uh, supply outlook. So t walk us through what's going on with the oil markets and how you see that market impacting the other assets that we'll talk about. It, it used to be a lot more. I think energy equities have been some of the best investments the last few years. And that was one area I fully endorsed. Um, and I always pointed out, if you're bullish energy, don't buy the underlying um, commodities that track 
the energy commodities because you're most always better off buying the producers. Why? Because the producers can create more with less on a daily basis. And by doing so, they pressure the price. So it's just such a small factor now compared to tech. Um, so, but the key thing is I look from energy is what's the indications? Energy is a great indication of the organic economy, like copper, demand pull for things that are related to the economic case. And the fact that crude oil is down about 19, 20% on a annual basis and copper's down about 14% on an annual basis and gold's up, that's a bearish indication for the stock market. And so what does that mean? Okay, forward-looking measures are showing deflation, the Fed should be easing. They're still tightening. That's the lose-lose for risk assets in the macro. And from an energy standpoint, pointing out deflation, but the fact is the Fed's still focused on inflation and tightening, that's bad for equities. Why is OPEC cutting supply again? Because they have to. They, they say it's it's one of the best. Well, some people said that they were doing it because they were upset with the Biden administration for not buying back from the, the SPR starting to. Um, but I think it's more the macro. Why did they cut in October? They cut two million barrels back then um, because they see what's happening with the tilt towards that demand that everybody was hoping from from China that's coming. The significant risk of the U.S. and the most of the world heading towards recession, particularly in Europe, and central banks still tightening. They see it now. It's a bank crisis. So if I'm an OPEC and my job as a cartel is to keep the price stable and higher, yeah, it makes sense to cut. But the history of OPEC cuts like this is they coincide with significant bear markets. The most significant was 2008, massive OPEC cuts. And I like to point out back then, OPEC was 40% or so of global Consumption, now they're about 30% of global consumption. See that trajectory? They're becoming less and less significant. The most sick, bearish thing in energy and fossil fuels is this massive surplus of excess supply from US and Canada running around 4 million barrels of liquid fuel a day. Um, and OPEC's cutting one barrel barrel. Remember, 10 years ago, US, US was the largest importer, now the net exporter and the largest exporter of LNG, liquid financial gas, which is, by the way, now at the lowest price since 1990. Or the, I'm not the lowest since, but when I first started trading in 1990. Uh, just sidetracking uh, one moment, and we'll get back to uh, gold and and uh, some other commodities. Everyone's talking about how uh, the end of the petrol dollar could be in sight. Uh, we see countries like China uh, burgering deals to buy gold, or uh, sorry, buy oil rather, in uh, in, a, in a currency that's not the U.S. dollar. And uh, just recently, I believe uh, Brazil is adding the yuan to its reserve currency. And so, w when we're seeing p countries trade oil in another currency that's not U.S. denominated, my question is: Does it really matter when you think about how much oil the U.S. is producing? Like you said, net exported now through fracking, a lot of the oil that the U.S. is consuming is domestically now is now domestically produced. So I'm thinking whether or not this really even matters for the U.S. dollar long term because the U.S. is one of the largest, if not still the largest consumer of oil, and they're just making their own oil right now. So who cares what people are using to trade oil with outside the U.S.? Well, it's a good indication of the strength of the U.S. Like I said, you look at 10 years ago, the U.S. is transmogrified, a great word I learned from reading Kelvin Hobbes when I was a kid, into the world's largest energy producer net exporter. <laughs> okay, so when there's petrol dollars, it's because we're the largest importer, needing protection, need, okay, that's, is that bad for an economy or a country? Large, large, largest net exporter of agriculture. We can feed ourselves, we got energy, and it's just adopting the technology, and it's a system of discourse. So if you want to trade your anything, a commodity you want between countries in a country, in a a currency that typically has a history of no background, no discourse, no free flow of capital, um, no deep treasury and capital markets like the U.S. I'm like, good luck with that. Brazil is a melting – it's been a melting currency, except this year it's doing great. But most of those currencies historically do not do well versus the dollar over time. And I'm like, yeah, well, good luck. Um, but if you look at the newest rapidly advancing technology in the planet, cryptos, they adopt the dollar as a base layer without trying. And most widely traded cryptos are crypto dollars, tokens that track the dollar, Ethereum type tokens, whatever other protocol. Um, that's organically happened. Even though the U.S. pushing back on that, the, US, the world said, no, we want dollars. We don't want the yuan or the euro or the ruble. So I, I like that's just indication of the U.S. moving on and um, it's don't have to buy crude in, anymore. And I, the key question I like to ask when you're purchasing or selling these other what you do when, when you transact in other countries currency do you put it into their treasury bonds and i like to say well good luck with that one there's no deeper market in the world than the u.s treasury market
Let's talk about gold now. Uh, the relationship between gold and oil. Let's explain that for the audience and why you think that three thousand could be the next round number for gold to reach. Well, let's look at the. Uh, there's been a trend since about two thousand seven. I love to look at the price of gold divided by crude oil, and um, it's been upward. Certainly, if you measure um, the actual price, if you measure the physical, um, you know, the investment, gold always outperforms because you have no store value. It does. I mean, you have no cost of carry. It's about the same. But one thing I like to point out is um, this trajectory: the price of crude oil, or gold versus crude oil, adds around twenty-four barrels of crude oil per ounce of gold is the same as first trade in 1932. <laughs> so that's just, a, shows the stability of gold versus most assets, but it's breaking out higher now and it's doing it on the back of deflating indications from crude oil. The price of crude oil right now of $80 is the same price as like 2007. Gold's making new highs. And I think that's going to Continue. So gold has been bumping above this 2000 level for quite a while. It's been driving people crazy and frustrating them. But now it doesn't have a significant alternative. It does in treasury bills. But the key reason not to hold gold the last 10 years was the U.S. stock market outperforming the world. Why would you want to hold this relic boomer rock when you can get, you know, annualized 9% in your Schwab account by your own SBX fund? That's changed and changing. It just got way too far. So now it's the point where I think gold's ready to break out. Once we see that little pivot from, pivot from the Fed, markets are starting to price for it. Gold should do what it normally does. It's the store value. Now, remember, it did make new highs in the euro and the yen, um, and that's because the dollar is so strong. But usually it means it's going to happen in in, uh, in terms of the dollar. But I look at it also – Got to be careful having that with gold without um, Bitcoin in that space. And one way to look at gold, too, is it had – it's really also a measure of treasury bond yields. The treasury bond market last year had its sh sharpest backup, steepest backup in history by some measures. And now the market – prices are starting to go back up. Yields are starting to go back down, and gold is just starting to tick higher. So I look at gold as similar to it was in 2007 and 8 when it um, – was bumping up against what was around seven, eight hundred, and boom, it popped to nineteen, eighteen hundred. Um, by the time it got to 2011, 13, I think it's going to do similar and just get to 3,000 next, get above 2,000, and never look back. But that's actually very much not profound if we get this recession as predicted by most other indicators. A U.S. recession is quite good for gold, particularly as the Fed pivots, and also if we see that the U.S. stock market's not going to continue to outperform the whole world, gold's going to be a go to. Uh, you're you're absolutely right. In the past, why buy gold when you can buy an outperforming risk asset? There is another competitor on the uh, on the rise, though, in in light of rising interest rates or higher interest rates, rather. And that's just simply fixed income. Why buy gold now? Yeah. Is my question. When you could buy, you know, high cor high grade corporate debt at close to uh, double digit uh, interest rates, or even uh, mid grade corporate debt. Um, and and not have to uh, you know endure the uh, non yielding aspect of of this of this rock in a vault, which by the yeah. way you have to pay to store, right? Well, it's 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 minimal. You can buy GLD and most of these ETFs in, at fraction basis points, and nowadays you don't have to buy the equities. You don't have to put it in it. It's, it's just so easy. You push a button. You can even buy it through a crypto token. So I view this as complete complements. The key thing is there's limited upside. You buy a bond, you get the yield, and it goes apart as much. That's as much what you get. With gold, you have the X's of return. You can easily. I think gold's going to do what it did last time. It did a two X in a couple of years. Um, some of the miners will do that, but you have to be selective which ones you pick. But they're good. Compliments. It's also what happens when you say if you buy a T-bill, what happens after it expires? You buy it around four and a half, expires, and what if rates a year or two now from now are running percent? I think they might be or less. Um, it's that enduring trend. Um, and I like to point out it's the best performing commodity, major commodity on a one-year basis. Um, and it's best uh, best one this year, major, certainly compared to crude oil. And the key question you have to ask yourself is what stops that? Um, I think it's early days because typically gold would – you want to – Stop being long gold after it gets expensive, after we've had a pretty severe recession, the Fed's eased, and it's time to buy equities. Okay, well, it's like we're not even there yet. <laughs> we're not even there yet. I mean, another bullish case for gold perhaps is just a continuous weakness in the U.S. dollar. If you assume that the Fed is almost done raising rates and the other central banks around the world are not yet there, and so you're seeing this interest rate differential uh, go in favor of other currencies, putting weakness in the dollar, which is good for gold, right? We got some markets for pricing for that already. And the Fed's 
um, Fed funds futures are already pricing for lower rates. I'll type in my on the screen right now for um, we're looking at by the end of this year, rates are currently around 5% looking for 4.3% in Fed fund futures. So it's already priced and it's not in other markets, but other markets will follow. And if you know what happens at the U.S. recession, it goes in recession. It's the man pool economy in the, in the country, in the, in the, on the planet. I mean, Europe's going to go into the rest of the world. You know, the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world uh, gets to catch a bad cold. That's just going to happen um, typically that way. So, and we're also, we're leading that way. And then we also have this presidential election coming up. So that's going to be a, a major shift. But I, 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 I don't see the, basically you can talk about current trajectories. And current trajectories are um, what stops it. And that's the key thing I like. I like to say is typically for me to say, okay, I'm, it's time gold rallies over, and you'd have to have the be well past that period of Fed ease and stock bear market. We're not. Seems like we haven't even started yet. Um, finally, I want to talk about Bitcoin. I think you and I spoke about this topic uh, a year ago or two years ago uh, during I, during the bear during the bull rally rather. So yeah, it was probably two years ago, and you had told me that. For Bitcoin to reach hundred thousand dollars, it just needs to do nothing. Basically, uh, if you look at the historical uh, uh, price appreciation cycles, uh, the next up move upward uh, from current prices, hundred thousand dollars would not be uh, improbable. Do you still hold that view? Oh, I do. Um, and what happened was that actually happened in the Ethereum, the equivalent Ethereum um, rally. About I think it was what, 10x or so was what I was expecting in Bitcoin. Of course, we had the miners kicked out of China. So it did not happen. Got high, it was around 70. And I fully expect Bitcoin is going to return to that trajectory. But I don't know if the bottom's in yet. The key thing, the thing about Bitcoin is it has something I've never seen before in almost any asset, certainly commodity, is definable diminishing supply and low in early days of adoption and becoming global digital collateral. I fully expect it's going to go that way. Now there's bumps in the road, there's issues with regulation, but one thing we're seeing recently and lately is it's starting to shine as indestructible. It just, the thing never stops trading. I'm just, from an ex-pit trader, when you know markets would lock up and you'd have halts and things, it's just shocking. Um, and now this banking crisis, I think, is starting to define gold, um, Bitcoin, as its value. As the, you know, the last crisis really was its birth, now this is defining it. But the key thing I'm worried about in the shorter term is um, the tide going out in all risk assets, like I mentioned, and Bitcoin being pushed lower. But it's, right now, it's showing what I think is going to happen is it's going to continue outperforming most, most risk assets. The key point is, though, we're still not – we're still – point of liquidity and it's still one of the most riskiest assets i think it's eventually going to trade more like gold and treasury bonds which it has been but all assets have bounced this year it's when we get that rollover in a recession in equities i have to see how bitcoin can outperform the key fact is i think it's going to continue to outperform most other cryptos particularly the bloomberg galaxy crypto index and there's still there's so much speculation in that space that needs to be purged and that's indicative of what you saw in inflation Mm -hmm. All right, bottom line, and we'll end it here. Mike, uh, best asset and worst asset for 2023? Um, I think gold and treasury bonds will be some of the best, and I think the overall stock market will be along with – well, it's not fair to say natural gas. It's already down. I predicted it. I suggested it would go down. I would say from this point on, the equity market will be um, one of the worst performers. All right, excellent. I really appreciate your very thorough analysis. Mike, where can we learn more about your work? Is your do you have like a website where we could go to or where we can well, read your reports? First on the Bloomberg terminal, I'm on your reports. Um I'm on LinkedIn. Just look for me, LinkedIn. I'm happy to link in with people. I'm happy to add people to my distribution list. And on Twitter, I'm Mike McGlone. I'm at Mike McGlone eleven. All right. We'll add those links in the description down below. Thank you very much for joining us today. Mike, appreciate your thoughts. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.